and then I'll give a little discussion about how we'll proceed. Very good. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, and welcome to the Wilson Center. Welcome to the Canada Institute. Eric tells me it's raining outside. <laughs> because of the rain, it's hard to get a cab. And by the look of your shoes and the bottoms of your trousers, Eric, I believe it. Uh, you don't need a note to excuse your uh, <laughs> timely entrance. Uh, and welcome to those that are following us on, uh, on webcast today. Um, this is a, a terrific event and a great turnout for folks coming, uh, folks in Washington coming to talk about the, uh, the Canadian federal elections, uh, Canada in the hemisphere. Um, you know, we are, we are a, a mighty ally and a mighty force in Canada, but we are also small. And uh, so having, uh, having a, a big group like this is, is terrific for us. Uh, it's also terrific because we are not alone here. We've got our, uh, we've got some terrific uh, co-presenters, co-partners uh, for this event. We have the Canadian Council for the Americas and the Council of the Americas, uh, both of whom you're going to hear from uh, directly. So as the director of the Canada Institute, uh, I'm Laura Dawson, uh, and I'd like to welcome you here. I'm going to turn the microphone over to my friend Derek Farnsworth for a few minutes of, of introduction, and then I'll come back and I'll give you the game plan for how we're going to move ahead. Well, Laura, thank you. If it, if it was cold outside, I would blame Canada and say, you brought your weather with you. Instead, I'm going to blame my adopted hometown of Seattle and say it's drenching out there and, say, and blame myself for bringing the bad weather. So in any event, thanks all of you for coming and joining us today for what promises to be a terrific program on the Canadian elections upcoming shortly. On behalf of the Council of the Americas, I'm delighted to co-host this program with the Wilson Center. Laura, congratulations on your new post and launching such a an effective program of activities so early on, uh, and also with uh, the Canadian Council for the Americas. Ken, it's good to be with you and with your colleagues as well. So uh, I think we make some good partners, and uh, this will be proof of, of uh, that effort. I also want to thank uh, my colleague, Kezia McKegg, who uh, has done a great job uh, working to put this program together from the Council of the Americas perspective. And we're looking forward to a robust discussion today on the issues and the possible outcomes of the October 19 Canadian elections. These are important elections not just for Canada, obviously, but also for the United States. John F. Kennedy famously said, you all know this quote, but it, uh, it's worth reminding ourselves, famously told the Canadian Parliament that geography has made us neighbors, history has made us friends, economics has made us partners, and necessity has made us allies. I think that's a pretty good summation of where we are as two countries. Today, Canada and the United States are really conjoined twins. As neighbors, we share the largest international border in the world. Canada is our largest trading partner and single largest foreign supplier of energy. And we're also close allies in international fora on many global issues, from the anti-ISIS coalition to NATO, of course, to peacekeeping in Haiti and various other actions across the globe. Nevertheless, Observers in Ottawa and Washington have noted a recent period of somewhat tepid relations between these two very good friends. While both governments share some responsibility, it's impossible to deny that, broadly speaking, the United States is often guilty of taking this vitally important bilateral relationship for granted. We believe that Washington must be more intentional in its approach to Canada and Canadian affairs. Like all human relationships, diplomacy with friends requires tending at the highest levels. It's easy to focus on trouble spots, but an, an intentional focus on building international friendships often pays off even more. And we also believe that both countries would benefit from a stronger and more consistent focus on North America. The rationale for North American regionalism is compelling to build a joint regional production platform that's globally competitive and integrated. The North American idea really is vested in two key institutions, the North American Free Trade Agreement and the North American Leaders Summits, but again, both of these institutions, in our view, require tending. NAFTA is a four-letter word in Washington, but nonetheless, NAFTA was a true innovation and has been a success, and it bears repeating as many times as we can, NAFTA is and has been a success. Trade among the countries of North America is now nearly four times greater than before 1994. 
Moreover, North American supply chains have become tightly integrated over the last two decades. Twenty years later, however, the international trade and investment landscape has changed dramatically and the agreement is beginning to show its age. Just think about the difference in the global economy in 20 years. Facebook has only been around for 10 years. There was no social media. Think about the entire energy revolution that's not just impacting North America but globally. There was no fracking to speak of in 1994, fundamentally changing energy relationships. Think about automobiles. In 1994, the car you were driving compared to the car that is literally driving itself today, it's a new world. And yet, the operational framework within which we're operating in North America, cutting edge at the time, has not really been updated to take advantage of those changing circumstances. However, as we speak, negotiators of the Trans-Pacific Partnership countries are attempting to conclude the mega regional agreement right now in Atlanta. The participation of all three countries, all three North American countries in TPP offers an important opportunity, we believe, to upgrade the North American economic community to 21st century standards. Yet the dispute in auto parts, in some ways, demonstrates that old habits die hard, that we still have a ways to go. Reports indicate that the United States, perhaps, cut a separate deal with Japan on domestic content rules for car manufacturing in North America without fully consulting with our North American allies. In my view, this cannot be the template if North America is going to work. North America's other key institution, the North America Leaders Summit, consists of a trilateral summit between the leaders of Canada, the United States, and Mexico. At the last meeting in Toluca in 2004, Prime Minister Harper offered to host the next one in Canada this year. To date, the summit has yet to be scheduled, and it will probably slip until next year. But we need to make NALS a truly annual event. We need to be intentional about it. It is already an annual event in theory, but the reality is a little bit more complicated. Recent ministerial meetings have sustained a trilateral focus in agencies such as energy and foreign affairs, but high-level political tension is also needed to move bureaucracies, and in my view, it must be a priority. At the same time, and this is my final point before I turn it back to Laura, and she's generously uh, agreed to moderate the panel that will follow. At the same time, North American issues are as much domestic in the Washington context as they are foreign policy issues. And then so, for that reason, I would call on the next U.S. administration to designate a senior official within the White House with the authority and gravitas to mobilize and coordinate both domestic and foreign affairs agencies, working with border state governors and Congress as well, in promotion of a strategic and effective North American agenda. This would require a rethink of how we do North American affairs in a bureaucratic context. Process matters in these types of issues. And I think it's an important priority. It should be an important priority for the next President of the United States, whoever he or she may be. These are just some thoughts to get our conversation going today, trying to be a little bit uh, stimulative and trying to generate some fresh thinking uh, around some ideas that affect all of us. In short, Canada's political future matters greatly to the United States and to the broader region. And that's why we, and I in particular, are looking forward so much to an outstanding discussion about these very issues uh, that we will be hearing about today. So Laura, again, thank you for your partnership for hosting. And with that, I turn it back to Laura Dawson. Thank you very much. Thank you, Erica. That, that was a, uh, a terrific uh, sort of segue into our, our next part of the program, but also underscores what we're trying to do at the Canada Institute with our uh, partners, the Council of the Americas, the Canadian Council for the Americas, my great friends and colleagues here, the Mexico Institute, the Latin America Program, um, to really put Canada into the Americas in a more meaningful, uh, substantive way. So uh, hopefully by talking about some Canadian stuff and some Canadian hemispheric stuff here today, we can, we can move that forward. We are going to start with uh, uh, my friend Nick Nanos, whose uh, greatest claim to fame is that he's a global fellow at the Canada Institute. 
but he also does some other stuff. He is uh, one of Canada's best known public opinion pollsters. Uh, he is the director of Nanos Research. He is on the news in Canada every waking hour. Any child that was born at the children at, at the hospital in Ottawa between uh, August and September during the Canadian election period, there's a good chance that boy child has been called Nick Nanos. Uh, he's uh, so well known that he's uh, become a household name, and we're just I, I'm uh, delighted that he was able to break away from from Ottawa and Toronto and uh, come and join us today. So uh, Nick's going to give us a 15-20 minute overview ripped fresh from the public opinion presses of what's going on in Canada. Uh, and then my panel's going to join me after that. We're going to take apart some of the issues for you and uh, have a good discussion about what might be happening uh, and where we might be going for October 19th. Nick Nanos. Uh, thank you for that, at least I think I'm thanking you for that introduction. Um, so I'm going to be presenting, uh, we do polling for the Globe and Mail, Canada's national newspaper and CTV News and we do nightly tracking. So uh, every day at 6 a.m. we release ballot numbers and at uh, 2 p.m. we release uh, numbers related to the uh, preferred Prime Minister. I'm looking at my watch. I'm going to be showing you some numbers that haven't been released yet so hopefully I won't get in too much trouble because we'll be 10 minutes ahead of uh, my paying clients who are paying for uh, for some <laughs> of the research. Um, you know, it's uh, it's interesting. Uh, this is actually going to be. We always during elections say how important an election is and how interesting it is, but you know the the reality is that uh, when we look at the particular the current environment, at least uh, one of the key backdrops is that there is a significant level of cynicism, disappointment, skepticism in terms of what I'll say the political environment in Canada and all of the choices. And that has really manifested itself when we look at the trend line at least. And this is our uh, nightly ballot trend line for, uh, for the election. And uh, you know there are actually three key phases of this election so far. Um, earlier on in September, uh, coming off of the Duffy trial, uh, the Conservatives took a hit. You know, the reality was that the Prime Minister every day was providing a clarification or comment on some twist or turn that occurred uh, at the Duffy trial uh, when his uh, former Chief of Staff was testifying and uh, put the focus clearly on the Prime Minister and his numbers suffered. And compound that, the uh, Syrian refugee crisis and the initial response of the Conservatives uh, also had a negative effect on the Tory numbers. And the New Democrats and the Liberals were doing quite well. But once that was behind us, what I'll say, the Duffy trial especially. Can you just explain very quickly, what's the Duffy trial, Nick? Oh, the Duffy trial is the trial of former Senator Duffy related to his expenses. So he's a conservative senator. There's a question related to his residency. There was a check that was written by the Prime Minister's former chief of staff for a personal check for $90,000 in order to cover his expenses. And uh, it's been a key fixation of what the parliamentary press gallery in Ottawa and what I'll say, the kind of uh, the political intelligentsia, at least, uh, in Canada. And we've had a trial. So the Prime Minister's former chief of, chief of staff actually testified uh, in August, coincidentally with the start of the election campaign, which was set, the timing which was set by the Conservatives. So they knew the trial was happening, but decided to uh, proceed anyways. So in what we've seen after what I'll say the first bit of the campaign is uh, what I'll say a three-way tie for all intents and purposes for about 16 weeks, 16 nights in succession. And not just a tie within the margin of error. On some days the tie was within one percentage point. And it speaks to kind of the current environment, the political environment in terms of Canada, Canadians trying to read entrails. Not just in terms of who they want but what is happening and how they might want to realize particular outcomes. However, what we can see is in the last seven days at least, a new trend emerge. A trend where the new Democrats, uh, who were quite competitive, uh, have actually started to slide and now they're at 26 percent nationally. So they're the line at the bottom at 26. I'll be your Vanna White. Yes. So the 32 percent would be the Conservatives, 31.7 percent the uh, Liberals, and then the New Democrats at 26 percent. Now, that move coincided, or the slide or change in the direction, coincided with two things. 
First of all, it coincided, it started the day after the French debate in Quebec, and it also started the day after the NDP launched their economic platform, which was the same day as the French debate. So those two events, either in combination or individually, started to move the numbers against the New Democrats. The other thing that it did was it shifted the focus of the campaign back on the economy because everyone was responding to the economic platform of the, uh, of the New Democrats. Their promise to have a balanced budget, uh, their initiative to have daycare, $15 a day daycare for Canadians. And I think many times Canadians aren't really public policy experts. They look at an issue and it has to pass the smell test. And I think for a lot of Canadians when they hear that everyone will be able to have access to $15 a day daycare, that they think that sounds expensive, right? And then at the same time, when the party is proposing to balance the budget, they wonder how that can be done. And what we've seen at least is the numbers for the New Democrats start to slide. But you know, the, the national numbers belie the fact that there's really no national consensus. That for all intents and purposes, we have five regional campaigns, very distinct, that are occurring with the parties having different levels of support in each of those regions. But the kicker in terms of volatility is that when we ask liberals who their second choice would be, more than one out of every two liberals identify the New Democrats. That's okay, I think that's too, a little too hard to read. But, and for New Democrat supporters, more than one out of every two would identify the liberals as their second choice. But the kicker is, is that ask conservatives who their second choice is, and 36% say they have no choice, and then the Liberals. This speaks to a high level of potential switching between the Liberals and the New Democrats. And the other interesting thing is that the level of undecided in this election is actually uncharacteristically low compared to every other national election that I polled in. Usually it's between 15 to 20%. In this election, it's between 9 and 11% on any given night. And I believe that this is a result of the fact that for many Canadians, they've decided that they're going to vote, however, and that they're not going to vote for Stephen Harper. It will be for either the Liberals or the New Democrats, uh, depending on how the campaign unfolds. But when we walk through the regional numbers, and these are the numbers for Atlantic Canada, on any given day, it's pretty clear that the Liberals will do well in Atlantic Canada that there will be a setback for the Conservatives in Atlantic Canada in provinces like New Brunswick and also Nova Scotia where they will lose seats. So that's the good news for the Liberals is that they're doing well in Atlantic Canada. The bad news is that only about 10% of the seats are in Atlantic Canada. So it's, it's not efficient at putting them over the top. But check out the trend line for Quebec. You can see that at one point in the election, early on in the election, the New Democrats had hit upwards of 50% popular support in Quebec. Basically the equivalent of the orange crush that we saw in the last federal election. And we see a 16 point drop as of last night for the New Democrats. And who's picked up? The Bloc Québécois has picked up. They've gone from a low of 10% to now 21.3%. And even the Conservatives are doing a little better than they've done, where they're tied with the Bloc Québécois. Basically a three-way tie for all intents and purposes, factoring the regional margin of accuracy between the Liberals, the Bloc, and the Conservatives. And we do know that there was a third issue that is special or had more of a focus in Quebec, and that had to do with the NICAB and the discussion about whether women would have the right or should be allowed to wear that when they were sworn in as Canadian citizens. The Conservatives believe that they should, be, they should not feel, they should take it off, while the other parties have been uh, a little more accommodating, at least to term a Quebec phrase, more accommodating uh, on that front. I, I was in Quebec yesterday. I thought they were talking about the kneecap issue, the kneecap Cab issue, and interest. it's the facial covering for women. <laughs> now, this is actually quite significant because if the NDP numbers start to slide in Quebec, the reality is that uh, it will make it very difficult for them to do well in the federal election because Quebec is their strongest region. The other thing is, is that we, I'm going to be watching the block numbers because if we enter into a coalition and the block manages to win somehow between three to seven seats, that they would potentially be a dance partner for any coalition or any party that was seeking the confidence of the House of Commons. 
But really, beyond Quebec, it's the numbers in Ontario, which is Canada's largest province, which are the numbers that I've been focused on. And it's been basically a dogfight between the Liberals and the Conservatives. If the Liberals and Conservatives, if the Conservatives are able, and right now they're at around 36%, both of those parties, with the NDP at 22, if the Conservatives can do well in Ontario, that means that they'll have a chance uh, to win the election. But one thing that I'd like to tell you about, in 2004, in the federal election, the Liberals were behind. Paul Martin and the Liberals were behind going into the last week of the campaign. And they ran a, what I'll say, they did a fear-mongering campaign on the close in Ontario and actually facilitated, and every, all the pollsters saw this, a six-point swing in two days away from the New Democrats to the Liberals, which allowed Paul Martin to hold on to the government. That's the type of movement that could potentially happen in the province of Ontario, where there are voters that are willing to strategically vote. They see the NDP as not necessarily competitive in their riding, and because they want change, they decide to vote for the Liberals. So it'll be interesting to see how the, uh, how the vote splits work there. But when we get to the prairies, we're probably not, we'll only see incremental change. The Conservatives are still quite strong in the prairie provinces. And uh, we may see a bit of a setback, a couple seats lost in uh, Alberta to the Liberals and the New Democrats. But the reality is probably only incremental change in the prairie provinces, which include Alberta, Saskatchewan, and Manitoba. And what percentage of votes are, are, are in the prairie provinces? Oh, probably, I would say, 25% uh, of the votes. British Columbia, and for anyone who's been to British Columbia, is actually a series of provinces. Because if you're in the interior of British Columbia, northern British Columbia, along the Alberta border, you're in the resource extraction business. You probably have views very similar to Albertans. If you get into the lower mainland, it's, there are lots of new Canadians. If you go on the island, you have more Anglophones and environmentalists. And, you know, I call this my spaghetti trend line because on any given day, you can see the numbers significantly move around in, uh, in British Columbia. And we also have the Green Party. I would watch for the Green Party to pick up one more seat. Elizabeth May, the leader of the Green Party, is on Vancouver Island. She has one seat. They could pick up one, another seat in uh, Vancouver Island, potentially a second. But uh, I, would, I would bet on one more seat. That's two for all of Canada. Yes. Yeah. So now these are the preferred prime minister numbers. So right now... Uh, as of last night, we have Stephen Harper at 33%, followed by Justin Trudeau at 27 and Tom Mulcair at 24. So you can see, coincidentally, with the slide and the New Democrat support nationally, the numbers for Tom Mulcair on the preferred prime minister front have also slid. And I'd like to note an interesting phenomenon that I'm seeing in the numbers, because we also ask Canadians about the leaders individually and their qualities. And what's interesting is that when we test on Tom Mulcair individually, he actually scores better than both Stephen Harper and Justin Trudeau. But his numbers as preferred prime minister in the last week or so have slid. What does this mean? This means that for a lot of Canadians, it looks like the emerging view is that although they like Tom Mulcair and believe that he's a decent man, fewer and fewer Canadians are seeing him as a prime minister. This is kind of like if we wanted to play Retro Hour, it's a bit like the Ed Broadbent syndrome from the 1980s, you know, as people would say, the best prime minister that we never had. He was personally very popular, but Canadians could not bring themselves to think of the New Democrats as a government or, as hi or him as prime minister. But even with that, we run a, a party power index that rolls up about eight different variables and it shows related to leader impressions and ballot preferences. And it shows that all of the parties are still relatively strong. That the NDP, although they're in a low cycle right now, should realistically not be counted out. So, where does that leave us? It leaves us with parties that are engaged in a different campaign. And when we ask Canadians whether they would consider or not consider voting for the different parties, it's clear that the Liberals have the highest potential vote, where one out of every two Canadians would consider voting for them. 45% would consider voting for the NDP in an independent question, and 42% would consider voting Conservative. So the potential for the Liberals and, and the New Democrats is good, but for the Conservatives, that 42%, you might think that's low, 
but that's actually good for the Conservatives. That's been as low as 36 percent. But the Conservatives are very good at delivering their vote. So <laughs> what should we watch out for? You know, the one thing, you know, we, people talk about the only poll that counts is on election day. Actually, they're very true. I look at the trends and directions of the number. Um, and, you know, the thing is, is that when someone answers a survey, there's no repercussion to saying, I'll vote for the Green Party, I'll vote for the Liberal Party, I'll vote for the Conservative Party. There's no repercussion. And uh, what I've seen in a number of elections is what I'll call this phenomenon. I can't believe that I'm voting for and then insert that I would say that in the last election in Canada in 2011, there were many Canadians that were unhappy with the Conservatives, that did not like what they were doing, did not like Stephen Harper, did not like his style, but because of the Liberal campaign and its faltering, went into the ballot booth and said, I can't believe that I'm voting for Stephen Harper. And I think it would be fair to say that on many occasions we've seen in other elections in Canada that this has been the case, right? that, you know, when people voted for Paul Martin after the sponsorship scandal in 2004, they couldn't believe that they did that, but Stephen Harper had run a poor campaign and Stefan Dion had run a poor campaign. All of those campaigns were not good. As a result, people ended up articulating or realizing choices that they did not intend. And we've seen this at a number of levels at the provincial level, right? where I'm sure there are a lot of Albertans who said, I can't believe that I'm voting New Democrat. But the conservative campaign in Alberta basically forced or led many Albertans to vote for the New Democrats. And I think this is what I'm going to watch. I think there will be two fundamental competing forces at play. The one competing force will be, and this is my concluding comment, the one com competing force will be people that want change. They're going to look at the numbers and then they're going to vote in order to realize change, whether it's voting for the Liberals or the New Democrats. And then there are going to be people who are going to be looking at issues related to risk. Which of the choices is the least risky? And I think this is what the Conservatives are hoping for, that people will complain and not be happy throughout the whole election, not intend to vote Conservative, but somehow in the last day or so, bring themselves to the realize, realization that the leaders are not competing against perfection. They're competing against each other and that they are all imperfect choices and that to win the next election, you just have to be this much better than the other imperfect choices. And with that, I uh, conclude my short, snappy talk. Thanks, Nick. We're not going to let Nick get too far away. We're going to keep him here, and, uh, and you'll be able to ask him some questions uh, during the Q&A session, and I may uh, impose on him to chime in during our panel discussion as well. But I'd like to now invite my co-panelists up to uh, uh, continue uh, with this discussion. Maybe I'll you want to leave that up there? Uh, no. 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 For, for the sake of the, uh, <laughs> the audience, let's, uh, let's yeah. um, Just quickly, Nick, while we're, while we're getting seated here, just uh, uh, lots of people know lots of things about the Canadian elections, and some people are, are brand new to them. Can you just quickly review which parties, which leaders? So Stephen Harper is the incumbent prime minister, and he's the leader of the Conservative Party. Justin Trudeau is the leader of the Liberal Party, currently the third party in the House of Commons. Tom Mulcair is the leader of the opposition and a former uh, provincial cabinet minister in Quebec. And the opposition is the NDP. And the opposition, so he leads the NDP, the New Democrats. And Elizabeth May is the leader of the Green Party. They have one seat in the House of Commons. And there's also Gilles Duceppe, the revived <laughs> leader of the Bloc Québécois. Uh, he lost in the last election and has just become the leader again. And uh, the Bloc Québécois has one seat in the province of Quebec. Great, thank you. I am delighted to have this panel with me today to discuss the Canadian elections. Uh, in Canada, we are um, uh, thinking that this is a, a very long and very dramatic election campaign, but it's always a matter of perspective. If you compare it to what's going on in the United States, it is really, really short and it's very civil. 
I, I couldn't <laughs> help it. <laughs> the other night I was watching the Republican debate and the Canadian uh, uh, federal debate, and I kept switching back to the, to the Republicans. Don Donald Trump is just uh, too captivating. We are, our candidates uh, are still quite, quite polite and quite civil with each other. And, you know, they're trying to, I think, in my opinion, they're trying to establish some distance on the issues, but they're remarkably close together on, uh, on most of the issues. So it's, uh, uh, it's a dramatic election campaign, I think, from a Canadian perspective, but uh, it's, uh, we, have to, we have to keep it in perspective as well. Uh, it's good, dramatic in a good way, I think. Um, I have a great panel with me, and I'm just getting myself organized. To my left, I have Jonathan Kay. And I was at the airport last night, and I picked up Jonathan's magazine. Woo! Oh. Jonathan is the publisher. Uh, editor, yes. Editor of the Walrus Magazine, which is a great magazine. And, uh, and I wrote that article. And you wrote this article. I haven't read this article yet because I'm an Uber fan, Jonathan, and I don't want you to... I became an Uber driver for that article. Did you? Yeah, and I took the City of Toronto taxi course, and I compared the two experiences. You're awesome. I, yeah, I was, uh, I'm quite a hero. <laughs> 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 we'll, we'll bring you back here for the, okay, the yeah. Uber talk, but uh, uh, I, he was also read a great article you wrote this week about uh, your unresolved feelings about Justin Trudeau. Yeah, you know what? You shouldn't leave that hanging because that like, <laughs> creates this weird thing. But uh, yeah, I, uh, I held, I just, and I should point this out uh, because of um, uh, bias. Uh, I, I did help Justin Trudeau edit mm -hmm. his, his memoir. Mm -hmm. And so I, had, I disclosed that. I was working in a newspaper and I disclosed that. But I, I should tell that to people just in case, so they know when I'm talking about him that we did share a literary pro uh, project together. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, great. Uh, Jonathan is a terrific writer, writes uh, for all sorts of things, and is one of those uh, guys who does the, the long form stuff so that we really understand what's going on, and we're delighted to have him here. To his left is Yannick Dumont Baron. And well he is the, did I say that right? Yeah. Okay, good, because I've been spelling. I, I, I think I tried to marry you off to Rosemary Barton. I think that was the problem last, uh, uh, last week. Uh, Rosemary Barton is a, another Canadian, uh, famous Canadian journalism, journalist, but no relation, right? Uh, is, uh, Yannick is the Washington correspondent for Radio Canada, which, if you don't know it, is also television. So Radio Canada is the CBC French language arm, um, but it is both radio and TV and the internet and all sorts of other wonderful things. So I bring a very thick accent if I, if I want to. <laughs> <laughs> I worked for 10 years, uh, started in Vancouver, worked for 10 years in Toronto. Uh, you, have, uh, you also reported from Mexico, Central America. You're the Washington correspondent. You've been everywhere, but it looks to me from the bio that uh, Yannick would like an invitation to Alaska because you've never been to Alaska. Never, ever. Is that a burning desire of yours? Sure, why not? Okay. Looks like I've never been to the north of Canada either. <laughs> Bring it on. We've got to get you up there. So right. he's accepting all, no reasonable offer refused. Uh, and to his left, uh, we have Ken Frankel. Uh, Ken, I, I feel like Ken and I have known each other for years. We, we've only passed you know, in person a couple of times, but he's been such a fixture uh, on Canada Latin American issues. Uh, Ken has been carrying the flag for Canada Latin American relations, running uh, organizations for the Americas in Canada when other ones seem to fade away. Uh, uh, Ken continued to promote the importance of this relationship. Uh, you are currently the president of the Canadian Council for the Americas, but you were previously the chairman of the Canadian Council for the Americas. Uh, you've had a distinguished career uh, with the Department of Legal Services at the Organization of American States. You are also a law professor. You've been a corporate counsel. Um, and apparently you were the, 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 the clerk to Federal District Court Judge Eugene P. Spellman in Miami during the Miami Vice era. era. Do you want to elaborate on that or is that just let that <laughs> sleeping uh, dogs lie? I can't elaborate on that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I like when people sex up their resumes with gratuitous references to Don Johnson. Right, right. right. <laughs> <laughs> That's very right. cool. Yeah. And Ken I just want it by association. Yeah. When they look at me, they think of Don Johnson. <laughs> right. and, and you are wearing socks with your suit today. Right. Right. Yes, I was. I, I should add that um, the reason why I stepped down as chair to become president is because I actually wanted to get paid for my efforts. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> oh, details, details. Uh, so... 
rather than doing a talk to me for 10 minutes type of, of panel discussion, we're actually going to do uh, a Q&A. So I'm going to mumble my way through some questions, and then these folks are going are to uh, uh, help to answer them and to, to elaborate uh, on, on the questions. Um, I, I think the, the taking from, from Nick's, uh, Nick's presentation about the I can't believe I'm voting for Stephen Harper again uh, uh, situation that we seem to have in Canada, um, I wanted to talk to the panelists first about public mood. Um, yeah, complaining about the incumbent is one thing, but actually being ready to uh, just flip the switch and choose someone different is, is quite, uh, quite a different thing. So uh, I just want to ask the, the panelists uh, just to get a, a quick response for them about the public mood in Canada and are Canadians really ready for change? Mr. Kay. Sure. Um, well, first of all, I'd like to say I really appreciated Nick's um, presentation because it gave the view from, um, from 10,000 feet up. My view as a journalist has been a little different. Um, I've actually gone with candidates around writings as they knocked on people's doors and heard what they had to say. And it was, it was actually, for an American audience, it was really interesting because I'd, um, I'd do that and then I'd go home and you know, I'd watch the American news and um, hear the fulminations of, of, uh, of Trump uh, and, and the other candidates. And it was actually really interesting because here in Canada, not to brag about our electorate, but it was like really specific issues. So, you know, um, C-51, which is thick kind of the Patriot Act, um, like in, in a much more complex way. It's security legislation. It's anti-terror legislation. Um, it's created a lot of civil liberties concerns, and that's very much on people's minds. The conservative government is, um, is promoting it. It's their legislation. They've enacted it. Uh, and the uh, NDP has said they're going to repeal it entirely, and the Liberals have said kind of half and half they're going to repeal it. Uh, people talked about Senate reform. Unlike the U.S. Senate, the Canadian Senate is rather toothless, uh, and for generations we've been talking about reforming it. We never will, but we'll just keep talking about it. It's kind of like campaign finance reform in the United States. Um, uh, what else did they talk about? Um, uh, you know, tax issues, uh, bringing, you know, the age of retirement back from 67 to 65. You, know, you hear all these nuts and bolts issues, and it's actually very refreshing uh, because these are the sort of issues that, that, that people should be voting on. Uh, and whereas when you watch the American debate, it's very much like huge symbolic issues, like Obama is disgracing us on the world stage. No, he's not. Uh, Benghazi was worth, worse than a thousand water gates. No, it's not. Um, you know, America can be great again. Uh, th things like that, sort of broad statements of purpose. Uh, whereas, as you said, I think the political mainstream band of um, allowable opinion in Canada is so much more narrow. Like immigration is a great example. Uh, the, the GOP race in the United States has just been dominated by who can build a bigger wall on the Mexican border, right? Uh, mine will be 60 feet or 70 feet or 80 feet. Whereas in Canada, you have pretty much all major party support for broad levels of immigration. In Canada, immigrates something like 260,000 people, which doesn't sound like, like a lot, but it's something like 0.7% of our population. And pretty much every major party agrees with it. There's like, you know, instead they're arguing about the niqab, which like eight people wear in Canada. Uh, and that's somehow become like this giant issue, especially in Quebec. Um, but yeah, but overall, uh, although there's a lot of Harper hatred, aside, putting that aside, it's actually, you hear a lot of rational, nuts and bolts policy things. I go to people's doors, they talk about the long form census. <laughs> Someone else, no, no, honestly, this is like the most Canadian issue. Bring back the long form mandatory census. Uh, I need to know how many bathrooms people have. Uh, because we actually did have a mandatory long form census, which sounds like the, <laughs> the nerdiest thing in the world, but our, our social scientists relied on it to do things like study poverty and, and you know, the metric system and stuff like that. And, um, and the conservatives got rid of it, and it actually became an issue because our chief statistician said, we've got to bring this back. And so you go to people's doors, and they're talking about the long-form census. It's, uh, it's kind of nice to see people interested in those uh, nuts and bolts issues. Public mood. And, and I, I apologize in advance, Yannick. I, you can speak f for anyone that you want, but it's also helpful if you can give us a Quebec view, which of tends course. to be rather distinctive in, in many issues, but not all. No, of course, it is. And, and it, my job is a bit different. My job is to report on the U.S. mainly. So th the most... Most of my time I spend thinking about what Donald Trump says <laughs> and how it, uh, and trying to sell that to Canadians afterwards. Um, but 
I've reported on elections in Canada before, and, and this one here, talking to my friends and my colleagues and, and seeing things, there is, many people want change, and they've said it, and they've said it in polls, it's above 50 percent, they want change. And these issues that you're talking about, it, I think it's also what I've heard many times, the issues of the day when I was doing the door-to-door -door and, and writing features and stuff like that in Ontario, around Toronto, in Vancouver, you hear these people, they care about one or two things and they're enraged about the other guy about that. But when it comes to time to make to go and mark that X somewhere there, I think I find that the focus changes a bit. Is They stick to their issues, they know what they want, but then they think strategically, as you said, especially in Ontario, where right now you're seeing the NDP is third, and at some point, you're going to get the mud starting to sling pretty soon there, trying to make the NDP a not a good choice. If you want Harper out, you need to vote for liberals. So at, I think at, at the end of the day, it, it's a split left-right, and that's, that's where most people will go uh, at some point. There. If I'm the, the way I read it is that during the campaign, it's fair to talk about your issues, but at the, at the, at the end of the day, you get a vote. You want Harper or not, and then people are going to start thinking, how do I get him out or how do I keep him? Mm -hmm. I, I find it interesting uh, when I was in, in both Toronto and Montreal this week, people refer to Harper, Mulcair, and Justin. So the liberal candidate has a more folksy... By the way, that Justin thing was is like totally a product of... Um, Harper. Well, it's Harper, but it's also careful marketing. Like his... His people wanted him known as Justin. But, but I think, uh, but it's, I don't think the intention, I, I, maybe the intention was to juvenileize or infantilize him, but instead it's making him friendlier. Yeah. But, but there's a thing, if I can add quickly, um, in Quebec, his father, who was prime minister of the country in, in uh, the late 70s, um, his father is still not liked by the older <coughs> crowd in Quebec. So having his first name as opposed to his last name is a bit like Jeb Bush here, right? Like you He's Jeb, he's not <laughs> the exclamation mark. Okay, right? interesting. There's also that for Quebec, at least. For, for the rest of Canada, the Trudeau brand, I think, is still very strong. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. Thank you. Ken, public mood. What's going on? Are Canadians ready for change? Well, I spend less time on the ground in Canada than anybody here. Uh, so I probably at least qualified amongst us to talk about that. But one phenomenon I do want to talk a bit about related to this. Um, a bit apropos, is there was a leaders' debate a sh uh, earlier uh, the er again on Monday, I guess it was, on just foreign policy. And Nick may correct me if I'm wrong, but it was the first time in the history of Canada that there was a debate just on, on just on foreign just policy. on foreign yep. policy, which is interesting. Uh, we held a quasi debate discussion three weeks ago. Uh, amongst the parties on their platform and policy towards Latin America, which is what I'll talk about uh, a little bit more later on. It was for sure the first time in the history that any kind of discussion or debate happened on Latin American policy. Probably the first time there's more than one person talking in, in the room talking about Latin American policy, well attended and watched on webcast. Uh, there is more, uh, I think there's interest uh, in foreign policy in Canada m amongst people more than there, there used to be. Um, this uh, pr uh, Prime Minister Harper, when he f first debates, uh, when he first ran, actually admitted uh, that he knew very little about foreign policy. And imagine how that would go down in the U.S. context of a pre in a presidential debate, the president saying, well, I really don't know much about foreign policy and I've never really been much, much out of Canada. <laughs> so I, I, I would say that there is mo a greater appreciation, and I think it's sort of rolled up in, in a broader kind of a theme, uh, which again affects to the Americas a bit, is uh, Canadians and Canada trying to find itself, trying to find themselves and trying to find its, situate its country uh, in a changing and evolving world. And so Canada uh, today is, does not have the influence or a position that it had <coughs> 25 years ago. It's a very different situation. And so a number of the issues that, are, that have been discussed during the foreign policy debate and intermestic issues, if we want, I think are th the overall tone of it is, is, is a country a bit trying to find its way in the world and figuring out where its niches are and where its niches no longer are.
Great. I'm, I'm going to, th this is a completely unscripted question, um, but I just want to, since we're talking about public mood and I talked at the outset and, and Eric talked about Canada uh, integrating or reintegrating or reaching out to the Americas, is there any change that you see in Canadian public mood vis-a-vis -vis relations with Latin America? What I would say is I think there's a greater awareness mm -hmm. of Latin America now. Uh, and I think there are a number of issues that are that are driving that. For one, there's more Canadian investment than there were than there was not that long ago. Mm -hmm. uh, this government has talked up the Americas, has made it a pillar of its foreign policy. Uh, there's there are differences as to how they approach that than than the other parties, and we'll get into that. Um, it could be argued <coughs> that the government, uh, well, the government could be argued they did a soft rollout of that policy, <coughs> so. There is uh, some question as to whether or not it's ever been fully articulated for the Canadian to public was why Latin America is important for Canada. Uh, but I know just by the people who come to our events, uh, and particularly in the business community, that there's greater and greater interest in the Americas. Right. Thank you. And I, one other thing I would say is there's one, <coughs> other, one other factor, and this, is, this, gets, this gets a little coverage, but uh, there are estimates of about a million uh, Latin American or people of Latin American descent in Canada, recent recent vintage in Canada. That's that's a phenomenon that never was. I mean, there was never a large Latin American constituency, and there's one estimate, uh, by and large, that there's a hundred thousand Colombians uh, in Ontario alone. Now, this is again, this is this is a new phenomenon, and I think that as that grows um, uh, and more integrated into Canadian society, there's going to be more and more interest. And I think, quite frankly, sooner than later, that's going to become an important political constituency, which uh, thus far really has not been uh, dealt with the same way or uh, addressed with uh, particularity as some of the other immigrant communities uh, or people have been in Canada for a while from other countries have been addressed by all three of the parties. Yeah, and for those new to this subject, a uh, million is about 3% of the population, mm -hmm. right, Maso Menos? Uh, you, Jonathan, you had a point you wanted to... Yeah, I just wanted to respond about how this was like the first purely foreign policy uh, debate we've had. That's true, I think, in nominal terms, but more broadly speaking, until relatively recently in Canadian history, the great dominant neurosis of Canadian life was our relationship with the United States. Uh, just as the great neurosis of American political life is reconciling the welfare state with the ideal of limited government, um, the great neurosis of Canadian life, we, we accept government and the, bureauc the bureaucratic welfare state, uh, so we don't have that tension in, in public life in Canada. But what we do have, uh, or what we did have, was this neurosis about America and our relationship. And you didn't even have to have a foreign policy debate to discuss it because you'd have any kind of debate and within five minutes, it would be, oh, you're in favor of free trade, so you're in favor of Canada being swallowed up by America. Uh, you know, you're in favor of us losing control of our water and our environment and our, and, and our, our health care system, right? Uh, def this supposedly defining uh, aspect of Canadian life. And growing up, this was why Canadian foreign policy debates, even if they weren't called that, were so stale, because it was just um, debating the phobias that we had about the United States. And about a decade ago, that went away. And it went away for a variety of complex reasons. It went away because of Obama. It went away because the United States had this crippling, crippling uh, financial crisis. And as a result of that, you had sort of small town Ontario businessmen buying up condos in, uh, in Orlando for $100,000. And, and suddenly, Canadians felt like they were the wealthy cousins in North America. And it, and it destroyed this inferiority complex we had. Um, and then you had Harper, who has a very muscular foreign policy. So. One of the great virtues of public life in Canada in the last few years, whatever you think about Harper, is that we can actually have a discussion about a hundred different topics without it becoming a proxy for how we feel about Washington. Um, it's, it, it's really the first time we've had full political and cultural independence um, uh, in, in uh, yeah, I'd say the last decade. Mm -hmm. Nick, you have, I've had my back to you the whole time, and you're the, like the master of public mood <coughs> and, and public change. Is there anything you wanted to add to what you heard? Yeah, I find, uh, you know, I think it would be fair to say that uh, on a number of issues, actually Canadians believe that Americans are ahead of them. So on issues related to the environment, for example, they look at, uh, you know, the policies of the uh, Obama administration on the environment, and they're like, why can't we uh, move in that particular direction? And I think the w I would say the one dividing line is foreign policy. 
um, because you know the the interesting thing is that when we look at Canadian foreign policy, specifically for example uh, the policy the, of the Harper government on the state of Israel, it's it's not what the usual policy is for Canada, which uh, uh, tends to also focus on the Palestinians, and uh, but it's because the prime minister has uh, has a personal view on this and uh, has been very vigorous in terms of his defense of the state of Israel. But the interesting twist in all of this is that we've seen foreign policy kind of collide with uh, politics, where, you know, not just the personal views of the prime minister on the state of Israel would be kind of articulated, but that the conservatives would know that there might be five seats that could be in play in Montreal and Toronto, where there are significant uh, Jewish populations, where you know the prime minister's position would be very popular, uh, would actually be a deciding factor for a lot of those voters. And we've also saw, seen the prime minister engage in a policy on the Ukraine, where he was quite vehement in his uh, resistance to the, I guess we'll call it the rebel incursion from, happened to be from people coming from Russia. Um, and uh, that being a key motivating factor for Ukrainians who are concentrated in a number of ridings in Western Canada. We haven't seen a lot of that, I think, at least that level of explicitness, uh, where the personal views of a prime minister uh, have influenced a government policy, and that coincidentally are actually very good politics in terms of clusters of uh, voters. Can I? Do you mind if I address that? Go ahead. Sorry. Um, first of all, one of the first things you learn as a newspaper editor is that if you ever say the Ukraine, you get a hundred letters to the editor. <laughs> oh, it's, it's okay. sorry. Oh, scratch that. Please repeat. It's sort of like Ukraine. the Facebook. It's just Facebook. Ukraine. Yeah. It's okay. just Ukraine. Um, sorry, I didn't mean to, to be pedantic, but, uh. That's okay. You can verbally edit me. Any, Ukra <laughs> any Ukrainians out there, I, uh, I, f I feel your pain. Um, it was very interesting about the foreign policy thing, and I, you're the pollster, but I got to push back on this in terms mm -hmm. of it being the riding thing, because people have said, oh, Harper, he's after the Jewish vote, because it, it is true. For people who aren't in this room, Harper's rhetoric on Israel is actually, it's, all, it's stronger than the American rhetoric. Uh, and the, you know, Harper led this delegation to, uh, to uh, Israel a year ago, uh, and he gave this speech where, um, I mean, it, w it almost sounded like, uh, like a religious thing where he says, we will stand by Israel through fire and water. Um, I mean, I thought he was going to lapse into Yiddish at one point. I mean, it was just like really, <laughs> real. And I, I'm a supporter of Israel, by the way. I just, you know, full disclosure, I'm a Zionist myself. But I was like, oh, whoa, like what's going on here? Um, but I don't think it was because of the, of, of the Jewish vote. What's happened in Canada is that when it's kind of like the United States, when you say I support Israel, it's a proxy for 10 other things, right? Mm -hmm. It's like, I'm a hard ass on terrorism. I'm a hard ass on militant Islam. I'm a hard ass on the United Nations. I'm a moral absolutist. I'm not a moral relativist. I'm against the kneecap uh, and probably kneecaps too. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it, it, by, by, by going to Israel and saying that, you can say a dozen other things that might seem politically incorrect to say or that would seem too morally absolutist. And I think it's become a sort of shorthand in Western politics. Mm -hmm. Uh, which is one of the reasons why Israel is, um, you know, it's, it's, it's perfectly true that 10 or 15 years ago, uh, Canada did have a more nuanced position. Um, you know, we, we, we would talk to all sides. We had this expression, honest broker, which has become such a cliche that people don't even use it anymore because uh, it sounds so silly. But there was some, a grain of truth to, the, to that, and we, we talked to both sides, and we prided ourselves on it. And I think that's one of the things you were talking about, Ken, when you said we've lost our stature in the world. I don't know if that's true, but to the extent it is true, I think most people would identify that aspect of it as being, being something we lost. Great. Yeah, I, I, when I say lost stature, I would say it does not have the same influence. weight or the yeah. influence that it used to have. You know, when trade ne negotiations used to be Canada, U.S., Japan, and Europe, and basically cut a deal or, s or, some, or some, some variation on that, for example, that's just not the case anymore. And I think actually that is in part what is driving uh, uh, Harper's Latin American policy. When he first announced it in 2007 to 2008, 2008, I guess, is when he announced it. They were formulating it before that. And the, some of the speculation was, well, he was just doing it as a proxy uh, for the United States, that, in fact, he was going to be, as you say, an honest broker. And, and for a long time, in the think tanks in the United States and even in the city, you would ask, what do you think the role is for Latin America? And they would say, well, they should really be an honest broker between the United States and Latin America. Uh, and then the rejoinder is, well, do you think Canada has its own interests in the Americas? 
uh, and which is something that had never been articulated or had actually been been thought about. Um, so, I, I'm gonna actually uh, we're going to go to issues in, in just a minute. I just want to finish off with a regional, uh, a little bit of a regional closure here, uh, and I'm just going to uh, pick on, on Yannick. I, could you? I, are there any particularly strong divergences? Uh, between uh, Quebec and the rest of Canada on specific issues? Is there any anything that you would say, you know, uh, it's pretty uniform on these issues, but on this, quite a bit different. Can you identify if there's any of those? You, you mean foreign policy? Any policy. Foreign, domestic. We'll, we'll move on to policy issues writ large in a sec. Well, I think it's it's a matter of degrees most of the time, mm -hmm. right? Like if you look at older issues that are not at play in, in this election, um, when it was time second world war like do we go at war and all that like quebec has a different way of thinking about things than the rest of the country mm -hmm. so, so many of those social issues um nick mentioned uh, that daycare thing where it would mm -hmm. be subsidized by the government in quebec it is in place it has been for well, over a decade now if i'm not mistaken so the, there's we think in quebec they would say the, the social issues are a bit stronger they, they resonate more same for the NICAM, right it's identity that it's tied to identity more so than it is in Ontario. But, but that's the, the paradox of Quebec, that in terms of social values, it's more European and more left-wing, but in terms of some of the identity politics values, it's the other way, yes. that it's, yeah. it's more seen as more right-wing, which makes sense to Quebecers because of the French Republican uh, model, but doesn't make sense in the, in the lexicon of the rest of the continent. But I, I mean, my, um, one of my greatest fans, my mom, explained it to me uh, recently that way. It's, it's a bit like, it's tied to the French language and the identity and the culture of Quebec and the NICAB for them, for most people, and it's not necessarily influencing how they will vote, but 90, above 90% 90 in Quebec are saying, yes, you should remove that scarf when you, before you, you, you're sworn in. And it's, it's because when you come to our home, you should, do, you should respect our rules. That's mm -hmm. super strong in Quebec. Mm -hmm. So on, and on any issues where it touches that, you would see right. it probably a difference with the rest of the country. And, and, mm -hmm. and the, the respecting our rights is the your human rights, that when you come, you should embrace our respect for uh, women's, uh, women's equality, women's rights, etc. So where perhaps in other parts of Canada, it's maybe we're willing to tolerate difference for mm -hmm. a while. Quebec is more active as saying, no, this is your human right to be, you know, Un uncovered here. Yeah, and even, you know, when you look at some of the Quebec numbers on issues like immigration, it's the support is, you know, to Jonathan's point, yes, there, there's agreement, but there's less intense agreement in Quebec compared to on other part, on, on things like immigration. That's for the immigrants are people that come to the Quebec borders, and that's all they're thinking about is how are they going to assimilate into our culture. And uh, as you, as opposed to, you know, two provinces that have the greatest number of immigrants, Ontario and British Columbia, much higher willingness to bring more immigrants, to bring Syrian refugees in uh, compared to Quebec. And you know, one of, one of the issues, at least in the polling, is the environment. Quebecers and British Columbians uh, are the ones that are the most environmentally sensitive and attuned and uh, you know, they have the luxury of having Hydro-Quebec and generating you know, their energy primarily by hydropower. But, uh, I would say that they're at the forefront, which is why the Quebec government has engaged in agreements with the California government on issues related to the environment. They've looked outside of Canada for other jurisdictions that they believe are like-minded. But I would put, uh, in addition to kind of the immigration thing, I put the environment on the table as an issue that uh, Quebecers have a much higher level of sensitivity and sense of importance compared to Canadians in other parts of the country. Great, great. Well, let's, let's dial it back to the issues a bit, uh, uh, focusing specifically. We've talked a bit about security and defense. We've talked a bit about relations with, with Israel, about climate change. So let's be a bit more specific. Uh, uh, trade and border issues, close, near and dear to my heart. Are there any of the candidates that are taking um, outlier positions, divergent opinions from what we've seen the Harper government to do? Is it, is, are there any of them that would strike out in a new direction on trade and border issues? Ken. Uh, well, if I may, uh, with respect to Latin America, um, there are differences among the parties on both of those issues. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the hot, hot issues for <laughs> Canada and Latin America was the imp imposition of visas on Mexicans and the 
what was considered to be a very onerous process for, Can for Mexicans to come in. It had been uh, for Chile, and, and that was rolled back in Chile. Chile. The Chileans now do not have to go through that, but the Mexicans uh, do, and that caused uh, no uh, small amount of tension between the Canadian government and the Mexican government, so much so that, and, and Eric in his opening talked about the postponement of the North American Leaders Conference. The, the thought was that really was postponed because the Canadian government did not want to deal with the outrage, as it were, or the, the, the extreme discontent that the Mexican government had at the way the Canadian was handling the visa issue. Um, the, other, the other parties um, have said, and they said at our, at our debate, that they would, they would lift the visa obligation for Mexicans and w would work very quickly and expeditiously to try and roll it back for the rest of, of Latin America. And the conservatives hold very, very close to the, the line that they have been taken. Now, I will say as an aside, I think that, is, that whole issue, which is a hot-button issue, and by the way, President Peña Nieto so far has not come to Canada uh, precisely because he does not want to step foot into Canada while this is such a hot issue. It's a hot issue in Mexico as well. It gets a lot of press down, um, press down there. I think, uh, curiously enough, that whole issue is going to be ob obviated shortly with, and the government has announced the, uh, the um, e-travel authorization it's going more towards a little bit less of what country you're coming from for a visa, but what your risk profile is. And I think that's something that will, they'll roll out with respect to Mexico. And I think, quite frankly, and as I know, the Mexicans, I think, will be more than content with that. And the government apparently wants to think about rolling out elsewhere um, in the hemisphere. Let me just interrupt you quickly. Yep. I, 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 just, uh, I don't want to be talking out of school, but isn't it the case that, the, that Canada will also recognize uh, a valid U.S. visa if uh, a Mexican is holding a valid U.S. visa once they roll out that electronic travel authorization? Well, that, that, was, always, that was always the position that, in fact, if, if, if the American, the, with the scrutiny that it goes through the U.S. system, it recognized why wouldn't it then, why can't Canada just rely on what the, what the U.S. system has done? But I think the e-travel authorization is still going to be, a, it's, it's a Canadian-generated uh, uh, concept based on what happens in Australia now and I think a few other places. So quickly, just to turn to the trade, there is, and there is, an, there is a difference on trade. Um, the, the Harper government is very strongly supporting the, the TPP, um, Trans-Pacific Partnership. Trans-Pacific Partnership. Uh, they, uh, which I like how we have an acronym COP <laughs> who just, yeah, just jumps in whenever. That's great. Right, right. The, the TPP. Uh, the Liberals also support the TPP. There are, there are, var there are issues that may, may raise a little bit later, later, a little bit about essentially what that means for the Canadian auto manufacturing sector and what it means for the Canadian dairy sector. Um, but at the end of the day, the conservatives and the liberals are supporting that process. The NDP uh, has not endorsed it, and they said they want to take a, a hard look to see what it is before they endorse it. But privately, I think they will tell you that there's no way that Canada can stay out of that agreement if, in fact, all the other nations are going to sign on to it. So there will be some issues around, well, should farmers or get compensated some way or their quotas be bought. It's, it's a supply management system. Uh, and what might be happened to, to try and uh, soften any blow that the auto manufacturing sector might feel. But at the end of the day, well, there, there is that difference. I think at the end of the day, probably it's, it's more, a bit more rhetorical now than, than substance. I agree. Um, if, if none of the other panelists has anything burning on trade and borders, and we are going to get back to relations with the U.S., uh, I'd like to move on to uh, some of the other issues. Is that okay? Uh, energy and climate change. I mean, uh, Canada, U.S. Uh, cooperation on energy issues, uh, Keystone XL, the, cr the crazy plummeting price of oil. Uh, this has become, this is a very big issue in Canada. Uh, and then what Canada is doing to mitigate the effects of carbon uh, on the on the environment, so energy and climate change. Um, are there any particularly strong positions you're seeing from any of the candidates, and do you think that that will really matter in voter decisions? Maybe I'll leave that part to you, Nick. Does it really matter? But mm -hmm. what, what are you guys seeing? Um, yeah, does it really matter? I, I don't think that people are thinking about Paris mm -hmm. and that agreement that needs to be negotiated when they're going to vote mm -hmm. in October. Um, I was surprised. I looked at. A chart well made that was basically trying to draw lines between where we are now in terms of emission and mm -hmm. the promises of each party. 
And the Green and the NDP had pretty much the same targets, which were the most uh, aggressive in time and in amount of green gas, uh, greenhouse gases. Um, the Liberals, it's a bit sketchy because they tied it to a reduction in percentages. Mm -hmm. So we don't know exactly when and, and how. Um, but the Conservatives, w it was the less, uh, like the shortest and the, the smallest amount promised. But I think, and, and Nick, maybe you, you can uh, help us with that. Like I think most Canadians would want to see more done than what Harper has done in past 10 years. And that the previous Liberal government has done as well when um, talking the environment, was talking about the Kyoto Protocol at the time, right? We, uh, I, my feeling is that the Canadians wanted more being done, and for many reasons, the governments, the Liberals then, and then the Conservatives have not done enough. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think, you know, I think if you'd asked an average Canadian, the default would be that they would believe that they would always be, Canadians would be better than Americans on the environment. That would be the default sense of identity but then that's come up against the reality of the last number of years where it's been fairly clear that uh, Canada not only lags the United States on this, but has, uh, has not been up to scratch internationally. And, you know, just from a public pin opinion point of view, you know, we could crassly put Canadians in, in the country into two buckets. The energy bucket, the en so there's the Energy Canada, and the non-energy Canada, and they're kind of like two solid, the two new t solitudes now, where if you're part of the energy economy, you're very sensitive to the price of a barrel of oil. Uh, you have a particular view on the role of the energy co economy and prosperity, um, and it probably affects your view on on environmental issues to a certain extent. And then if you're not part of the energy economy, you're thinking, okay, well that's something interesting that's going on over there. But uh, you have different views on a lot of these issues, and that's that's been one of one at least of the fault lines in Canadian politics, and also in the Canadian economy. So you know, when the price of oil was high, the energy economy was hot, and the rest of Canada was flat. Now that the price of oil is down, the rest of Canada is still flat, but uh, economic confidence in the in the energy sector, which tends to be concentrated in the West has uh, dropped significantly. So that's been kind of one of the ways to kind of organize voters at least. And, and I would argue uh, the flat manufacturing, uh, declining price of oil has probably contributed to public interest in the TPP. It really was not nearly as interesting to Canadians a year ago as it is now. So I just want to talk a little bit ab about the energy thing because what's interesting is that because the energy, because energy has been booming in Alberta and Saskatchewan in that area, um, it's acted as a magnet demographically and attracted voters into that, that area. So the equivalent of the United States would be the way uh, shale, uh, the shale gas boom has attracted lots of, of younger male workers into places like, I guess, South and North Dakota and stuff like that. We've had that in a major way where, for instance, impoverished or people without much job prospects, say in Atlantic Canada, have you know, thousands and thousands of them have moved to Alberta, which we haven't talked about it yet, but Alberta used to be kind of like our Texas, um, but Alberta went to an NDP provincial government uh, recently. And I think one of the, I mean, there's many reasons, but one of the reasons is because you've had all these people who have come from outside of uh, Alberta and changed the political culture there. The other thing which is just really interesting to me is uh, a, a couple of years I wrote, a, a couple of years ago, I wrote a book about conspiracy theories. It was called Among the Truthers. And w at the time I wrote it, the dominant conspiracy theory in Canada was that we were a kind and gentle nation and that uh, these big bad Americans were going to come and take us over and you know the Trilateral Commission was going to be running Ottawa and the Illuminati were going to be running Montreal and, and it was just going to be like this big American takeover of, of but it was always in the name of oil, right? It was always in the name of big energy because it's, it's the most popular subject for conspiracy theories. What's interesting now, and I, I used to get lots of these uh, emails in my inbox as a journalist, and then what happened is just really interesting. A, our oil sands took off in Alberta, and then you had Obama being elected, the most left-wing president in, in modern history, and the conspiracy theories just switched. So now when I get a conspiracy theory in my inbox, it's like, yeah, you know, Canada needs to develop its oil sands, we need to build the Keystone XL pipeline, but those communists in the United States won't build it because <laughs> they're all such environmentalists. And in fact, even the Canadian government itself indirectly participated in this 
because what would happen is there'd be community consultations about the construction of pipelines in British Columbia or something, and you had government ministers saying, well, you know, these processes are being corrupted by these, these foreign environmentalists coming in from the United States. Uh, the idea being that these Americans were these carpetbaggers, tree huggers who were trying to destroy Canada's energy economy. I mean, this would have been unthinkable as recently as a decade ago. But you have this complete switch in the politics of Canada and the United States when it comes to that kind of issue. It's, mm -hmm. um, I mean, Canada's identity has been totally transformed in that cru crucial respect. Mm -hmm. So you heard it here first. If you have a conspiracy theory, send yeah, it to yeah. Jonathan K at walrus.ca. Yeah. That's right, yeah. yeah. You can carbon copy me on it because I'd be interested in that. Yeah. <laughs> oh, no, it's, it's, it's a really interesting phenomenon. Um, I want to turn to security defense issues, um, but I want to start it out with a Latin American preamble, I think a little bit. Uh, and, and I want to ask Ken if he would talk a little bit about Canada's engagement in Latin America or at least Canadian positions in Latin America on evolving security and human rights issues in Latin America. Are Canadians talking about this? Are they thinking about this? Are the Canadian candidates that you've been speaking to, do they have um, uh, something, something to say on this issue? I wouldn't say it's on the minds of the average Canadians. I don't think this is an issue that's playing out in the campaign whatsoever. Uh, security is one of the three pillars of the current government's policy towards Latin America. The first one is increasing hemispheric economic opportunity. One is increasing relationships, and the other one is addressing security, uh, f advancing freedom and democracy, human rights. Um, you don't hear uh, great differences amongst the parties with respect to security. I, th you do hear it and came up in our debate, and but it, it deal with the visa issue because the visa issue uh, comes, it presents itself as a government as it's important to have this visa wall or this, this uh, hurdle to get over because you want to make sure that terrorists and, and, the, and, the, and, the, and the undesirables don't get into our country. So it, it plays out. The security point comes, comes through that way. Uh, the, the typical uh, liberal rejoinder, which we heard at our debate, was, well, the Harper government sees what, a terrorist behind every leaf. and and hiding behind every rock or some there's a there's a expression that they use uh, and so I, I think essentially if it plays out with respect to Latin America it, it only seems to be coming out with respect to um, the visa issue having said that um, Canada is is now suffering some of the of the the drug and the gang issues that have that have come up through Central America uh, and so there there is some concern on on that issue as well, but it's not something that is widely articulated, at least amongst the candidates that I've spoken with. Interesting. I, I heard uh, there was a Pew study that came out this week, I believe, that said something like uh, 60, no, 40 percent of Americans would support a wall uh, 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 separating uh, U.S. and Canada. And when they pressed why they would support this, this wall, these were the same people who supported a wall with Mexico, and the feeling was that if you seal off Mexico, then the bad guys from Central America are going to come up to the United States through Canada. Right. So the, 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 the interconnectedness of, uh, of our hemisphere and perceptions of this are, are very important, I think. Yeah, you just reminded me, uh, when I was in New Hampshire at a Donald Trump rally, <laughs> I was asking really? about... Really? <laughs> That's part of your job. Yeah, yeah. That was You're part great. of the Trump camp followers. <laughs> the, um, I was talking about the wall with yeah. one uh, fine gentleman who was saying that it's really important we build it. And, and I said, we're in New Hampshire. Like, well, what's <laughs> so far from Mexico? And he was saying they're all over. They're everywhere. And he was also saying, you know, they could come from near Canada. But in, in reality, if they land, and I'm thinking legally, if they land, if they touch North America within Canada, they can't try to come here as refugees later. They have to apply in Canada. By the way, just uh, I remember, I'm old enough to remember uh, late September 2001 where there was an original false report that said that a couple of the 9-11 hijackers had right. come through Canada. And it was like, I mean, it, that was all Canadians were talking about because we just assumed the border was going to be completely closed down and we were all going to be branded terrorists. And uh, now, as it turned out, there was huge disruption on the border for all sorts of reasons after that. But that was like a huge deal mm -hmm. for Canada. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I mean, it turned out not to be true. But yeah. So let's just, uh, Ken. I, just yeah. I, I was remiss in that saying that the, the another issue that's concerning the government and the other parties will talk about when you engage them on the issue is the concern about what's happening in the Caribbean and Central America. 
and they see that as, as well as it's, a, it's an important issue for the United States and Mexico as well, uh, and that uh, the, the appearance of what might be failed states or narco states or, or states or governments that are where there's heavy transshipment uh, and uh, it's extensive uh, involvement is, is ultimately a security threat to Canada as well. Um, that's certainly been a bit the policy of the government, uh, and, the, and not just a threat to Canada, but actually a threat to the hemisp hemispheric stability. Um, and so that is actually also an important uh, pillar of the government, which the other parties rec seem to recognize as well. Yeah, that's a great point. Now let, let's just pull, pull back onto security defense uh, and do sort of a wrap up and then on security defense issues. And then I want to talk a little bit about governance issues for a minute. So ISIS, ISIL, homegrown terrorism, cyber threats, uh, Canada's assistance in the air war. Um, what's going on uh, with uh, security and defense in this election, and does it matter? Who wants to start? Yeah, I, I can start because uh, you know it's it's pretty clear that the conservatives believe, um, you know, it's kind of like security is on the bumper sticker of the of the bus. It's kind of like a secure economy, and you know you secure communities, and uh, you know we know from the polling is that you know whenever you ask Canadians, you know, should terrorists be punished, they say yes, of course. Uh, and that, uh, you know, the, the thing is, is that the Conservatives, if you think of the security kind of theme, is what they're trying to tap into, which is why many times what you'll see is the Prime Minister bridge, so like the Syrian refugee crisis, the way they got through it was to take a humanitarian crisis and convert it into a security issue. That was their response, right, which was, well, you know what, uh, you know, we have to be very careful in what we do. We have to, uh, you know, make sure that people are properly screened. And yes, uh, you know, we'll accept refugees, but we have to make sure that we maintain the integrity and security of Canada. And that's realistically how they kind of limped through that particular issue that was a humanitarian issue at, at the get-go. But, uh, you know, for the Conservatives, it's, it's one of those things where, to them, Everything is security, whether it relates to economic security or personal security. And, uh, and they know they've built their brand over the last number of years around that so that, you know, their pivot on everything relates to trying to get back to that particular view so that when, uh, you know, the thing is, is and to speak to Jonathan's kind of conspiracy theory, is that, you know, if anything related to a security threat occurs, perceived or otherwise during an election campaign, it'll be a prime opportunity for the Conservatives to kind of say that the, you know, that would validate their, their view on, uh, on the importance of security and terror issues. Security, defense, terror. I was trying to remember if the NDP was in, uh, against being in Syria and in Iraq, uh, because it, the Conservatives and the, the Liberals were sort of saying we should keep doing what we're doing. But I, I was trying to remember, that's why I was using the, uh, the Blackberry. I was trying to remember if... Uh, do, do well, th I mean, the big, th the big uh, controversy was when Justin Trudeau went on TV and, and made a joke about it, remember? About the CF-18s, and uh, he made sort of a vulgar joke about, oh, you know, your first response shouldn't be uh, to whip out your CF-18s, which went over very badly. I mean, <laughs> it was, no, it was really... It was like this really sophomoric joke that uh, that went over like a lead balloon, um, and that actually was the moment. I think it was six months ago or twelve months ago, where where the liberals' numbers went down precipitously because a lot of people were like, "Oh, you know, he's he's only like forty four or forty five years old. He's a young guy, but you know, he's got a lot of energy." But that was the moment when he was talking about foreign policy, where it was like, "Whoa, this guy is not serious enough." And and Stephen Harper, I don't know if you've seen him. He doesn't exactly light up a room, but one thing he does do is he presents himself as kind of the CEO of a company that is always profitable, and he's just, you know, he's the, if you look at the picture of the, you know, 48 white guys on the wall, you know, for a company <coughs> that's been around since the 19th century, he's like the 49th guy or whatever, and you just think, oh, that guy, he's, he's continuity. And when it comes to security, it's become really demagogic because, um, right now, the United States is at this interesting moment where even conservatives are saying, hey, like the prison industrial complex is just out of control. It's costing too much. We have to start letting people out of jail. They steal a Kit Kat bar, which can't throw them in jail for five years. In Canada, we actually are not at that level of sophistication yet because you saw those numbers. That's, that's like that hardcore 42%. 
among those hardcore 42 percent are a lot of Abraham Simpson types who are just constantly scared of teenagers at the mall and their support like any policy that will be you know if, if anybody does anything wrong throw them in jail and so you see that not just with terrorism but you see it with street crime uh, where you have this uh, basically a scaremongering campaign yep. mm -hmm. yeah. It, it, we, yeah just to draw that Quebec distinction there this is where uh, Quebec is more liberal and they would say we need rehabilitation as opposed to jail sentences all the all Quebec's the like our Vermont it's the opinions expressed at this table <laughs> are not necessarily <laughs> the opinions of the Canada yeah, Institute yeah. <laughs> well we share maple syrup right? yeah. so. I love Vermont by the way yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, Nick did you have no Okay, okay, great. Um, anything else on, on issues before we go? I want to talk, talk next about uh, potential relations with the United States, where you see uh, the positions on each of, uh, of each of the contenders. So I think we'll wrap up the issues for a minute uh, and, and talk about uh, the very important relationship with the United States. Uh, who would like to lead off? Uh, who do you see, uh, which of the candidates is going to get along with the U.S.? Is it important that leaders get along? Start with you, Jonathan. Okay, I'm gonna. I like to talk. Uh, it's interesting. Again, again, I'm gonna start off a sentence by saying I'm old enough to remember when uh, it was a huge deal the personal relationships between Canadian and, and, and U.S. leaders. Like, you know, Brian Mulroney's relationship with Ronald Reagan was this thing of legend. You know, they still talk about it in Canada about how they would like get boozy and teary eyed and they'd sing Irish eyes or singing or whatever that song was and smiling. Smile, yeah. I'm, it's <laughs> not my culture, so. <laughs> uh, no, and it was like this this thing, and Canadians were like, uh, it was kind of like watching, you know, the royal couple, if they were going to kiss or not, on the balcony of, of Buckingham Palace. You know, every single hand movement and gesture and man hug was sort of analyzed to see what relations were like between Canada and the United States, and that just doesn't happen anymore. Um, again, I think it's part of the reduction in the neurosis between our two countries, well, it, well, on the Canadian side. Uh, but it's also just the professionalization and bureau bureaucratization of, of relationships. Uh, you know, 99% of the trade relationship is managed by, by, by faceless bureaucrats. Things have been institutionalized. NAFTA sets a lot of the regulations. When there's a disruption, it goes to a NAFTA tribunal. And it doesn't necessarily go to a political level. It goes to, you know, softwood lumber. Does anybody in this room remember 10 years ago when we used to always talk about softwood <laughs> lumber? When's the last time anyone had an argument about softwood lumber? Um, we it's got about to expire. Maybe, about but you know, but it's, uh, or the Canada it's Wheat bad. Board, you know, the, the Canadian Wheat Board. I mean, there was just, or Split Run Magazine. Does anybody remember Split Run Magazine? Sheila, I mean, these are things that we used to talk about. And now it's just, we've moved on to other things. We've become adults. Uh, so I don't think, Whoever becomes prime minister on the 19th, I don't think you're going to see any significant disruption in Canada-U.S. relations. I don't think you're going to see anybody singing together or hugging or anything like that. It's just going to be this sort of business-as-usual uh, relationship between two longtime friends. Canada-U.S. relations, what could be different as a result of this election? Well, I, I, think, I think in, in I agree with what you're saying, that it, it is different now than it was in the past. Uh, and maybe stuff like acid rain, uh, NAFTA would not be there if they were not so close at the time, these leaders. And, and we could ask the question, would Keystone still be an issue if Harper and Obama were more buddies than, than they are now? Um, but but I, I think sometimes, I think maybe more in Quebec than in Canada, we, we see the relationship as it's the only corner store in the neighborhood. Right, so we need to do. If you don't want to take a plane, your vacation, you take it to. Quebe if you're in Quebec, you take it to the U.S. You don't go to Ontario. Mm -hmm. If you want to do business, most of it is done in the U.S. And it's there you have to deal with it. Mm -hmm. So okay, I'll go to the corner store. If the owner is super nice, I might go a bit more often or buy in more stuff. But they still go there for my milk. And I think, at least from the Quebec point of view, it's so often how we see it. So. Maybe then we leave it to the bureaucrats because there's not. By the way, it's not just. Uh, I should say it's not just bureaucrats. It's also digital technology. Uh, I did a big story in a trucking company, which seems banal, but you know, after 9/11, everybody freaked out because it took the trucks like 12 hours to cross the border. What they did is they put digital protocols in. So if you are in a truck, you're a driver. Everything is done online before you show up at the border. The thing might be sealed before you get there. Truckers have essentially become. IT people because they have to manage everything before they get to the border. The good news is you might pass the border in, f in 30 seconds. Mm -hmm. So like 
a lot of the, the a lot of the grievances were just things like you'd go to the ambassador bridge and wait for half a day. Those things largely been taken care of, and Canada's financing the construction of a new four billion dollar uh, bridge product project because the state of Michigan was too poor. Mm -hmm. So you know, again, 15 years ago would have been different, but now we have some more money. Canada U.S. relations, Ken. Uh, I can address Canada Latin American relations. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Yes, please. Okay. Um, Canada relations with Latin America a little bit echoes what Jonathan was talking about and Yannick. There's certain things that are just sort of set in motion that I don't think are going to change. Uh, I think there's essential focus that's dictated by economic and necessity and certain, certain I think, political affinities as well. There's no question because, because of Canada's uh, economy and how it's built that the Pacific Alliance countries are critical. I don't think anybody looking at and none of the parties would disagree with that. Uh, I think it's also critical that Canada develop a better relationship with Brazil. I don't think any of the parties agree with that. Mm -hmm. And I think it's very, very critical that Canada gets involved in strength, even more strengthening NAFTA. And that's a, that's a critical issue that they all see. Having said that, uh, if there were a change of government, one could imagine a more of an emphasis and, and a bit of a, a change of, of tone for sure. I mean, just an image. I mean, one could imagine um, Justin Trudeau getting off a plane in Cuba the way his father did, I mean, hair blown and landing on Havana, m maybe presenting a little bit diff a diff different image than one of the other two parties, certainly, I guess, uh, Prime Minister Harper. Um, so having said that the focus is more or less the same and, and, the, and the tone would be different, there are a few issues, if a couple of seconds before I run off to the airport, yes, I, mean, yeah. I apologize, um, where I, I think there would be a, a bit of a, of a substantive dif uh, difference. One is in the hemispheric move to reconsider the whole issue of drug, uh, of narcotic legalization, decriminalization, looking at it as a health issue. Now that's obviously a trend that's been going on in the hemisphere and the report that was done a number of years ago by Presidents Cardozo, Cedillo, and Gaviria uh, that was more or less echoed in the OS report that came out a couple of years ago that advocated considering different changes. Uh, that has not been something that the current government in Canada has uh, embraced, uh, certainly not uh, domestically, uh, and even when there have been attempts, at, I think, at the OAS General Assembly in Guatemala to try and move that along, that had not been something that Canada was, was a champion of. Uh, I think if there were a change of government, you might see Canada more engaged in some of those issues. Um, and willing to consider uh, alternative routes on the whole legalization, decriminalization issue. I think there is a, 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 a bit of a tone difference on Cuba. Um, you you got, must remember that Canada, the Harper government, was played host to the many of the important meetings that happened with the breakthrough that led up to December 17th. Uh, having said that, in the government and in our debate is very clear about what they think about Cuba. And yet the other parties don't necessarily disagree about the the analysis of the of the human rights uh, problems in Cuba, but talk more about engaging. And one of, one of the liberal one of the major liberal leaders told me that that Prime Minister should have been down in Cuba the next day, you know, flying the Cuban flag and talking about how important the, the important historical relationship is between Cuba and Canada, and inserting Canada more into that the evolving transition that seems to be going be going on in Cuba. Uh, the, the final thing I may say, uh, well, there's a, f there's a bit of a, a, a bit of a tone difference on foreign aid, how that may be helped, but that's a discussion that's happening across the board on on the maternal health uh, issue, which you may want to get to after I after I leave. Um, and, and, and this is again the, the theme of multilateralism versus bilateralism, in and in a funny kind of twist of fate, I suppose. Um, the first movement, really, or the, the impetus for moving into a more of a what was called uh, by uh, concentrated bilateralism which came through the f uh, father of Justin Trudeau when he was prime minister and the first real discussion of looking for a third way between the United States uh, uh, and uh, and another way to for Canada to pursue its uh, to, to f excuse me, for Canada to move away from just an over-dependence on the United States was something called the Third Way. It was a famous paper issued in 1968 by someone named Mitchell Sharp, and it talked about going to other countries. And at that point, actually, in the early 70s, and sort of forgotten law in Canada, or, or not more than law, but reality was that Mexico 
Venezuela at the time and Brazil were considered to be important future players for Canada. Now that, that string had been lost through the years and sort of gone up, you know, as Canada's made sporadic parries in and out of, out of Latin America. Um, the, 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 current, uh, the current government, as I say, actually is more of a concentrated bilateralist with respect to Latin America and one might argue with the rest of the world as well. Uh, and so it, it tends to be talk more of the language of strengthening bilateral relationships. It is a bit di disillusioned uh, at one point with uh, its disillusioned about some of the multilateral institutions that related to Latin America. Uh, and feel like it's been very disappointed about the failure to protect what it perceives and uh, on all the parties perceived to be growing uh, human rights concerns uh, in certain countries in Latin America. Um, and so they would, they, they would tend to favor that. The liberals and the, and the NDP talk more again about the, the traditional, I suppose, sense of the way Canada talks about multilateralism, although it is, it is um, leavened with the reality that uh, that um, bilateralism is important as well, but they uh, tend more about thinking about th these are multilateral approaches, and we have to seek more multilateral approaches on some of these issues, like like the narcotics issues as well. Um, with that, I, I apologize. I have a and you do I have a five thirty <laughs> flight to Europe out of Dulles, and so, mm -hmm. um, but I but I know at the end. Laura is going to ask for predictions, so I. Oh, you're going to hand that, that over. But you can't read them like the, until, like the until I'm long gone. Well, thank <laughs> you. I, I, your, your comments have been terrific, Ken. We really appreciate it. The, the, the only, the only bad part was that you have to go early. So thank you so much for, for thank joining you. us. Thank you very much. Um, and actually, uh, Ken's comments about uh, uh, Canada should be down in Cuba, waving the flag early, early, and often that this politics of personality, what did you call it, Jonathan, man-hugging on, on every issue, um, has been uh, perceived as important. Some of my best friends are in the media. I love the media. But mm -hmm. I and probably you get calls every week saying, hey, I think there was a snub. Mexico got a phone call. Canada didn't get a phone call. Yeah, our relations, right. our relations, you know, bad, good, <coughs> indifferent between Obama and, and Harper. Um, I, in, in my opinion, uh, relations have stayed about the same between the two. Early on, there was a lot of more personal contact. But... Uh, uh, talking to some colleagues here at the Wilson Center, there really is no other uh, country in the world, uh, country leader that, except for a, a few exceptions maybe, that Obama has close personal relationships with that make a policy difference. Mm -hmm. um, so that's, that's my editorial two cents mm -hmm. worth. Uh, Nick, do you want to talk a little bit about Canada-U.S. relations in this election? Yeah. And then we're going to turn to your, your predictions, and then we're going to open up for questions. So... Uh, there's good news and bad news. The good news is is that when we do surveying of Americans and Canadians on Canada-U.S. relations, <laughs> Americans have very favorable views of Canada. They don't see the border as an issue. They support trade, cooperation on security issues, and the views are very positive, regardless of whether you live in the south of the United States or in the North United States. I think the bad news is is that the relationship has been so successful that I would say that there's been complacency because it has been so successful. And the one prediction that I'd like to make on this, and this has to do with the TPP, is that the TPP, and if we get the automotive provisions that people expect where the foreign content requirements would have a significant impact on the Canadian automotive industry, negative impact, that that will be a wake-up call for Canadians. And I would say that because Canadians and Americans have been complacent in their success, I would say, that this tension related to the TPP and the new environment will represent a significant positive opportunity for whoever is Prime Minister to engage because the next step, you know, when I was working on my research project at the, uh, at the Wilson Center, we were talking to folks in the Trent Obama transition team and in the government and, and different uh, key stakeholders. And I remember we were talking about trade, and they kind of said, well, yeah, as soon as, as, soon as TPP's put to rest, we're going to have to uh, update NAFTA. <laughs> no. <laughs> but 
Nobody that, uses that word in this town. Anymore. Yeah, well, no, what I'm just saying. But the reality is I think TPP will be a spark for Canadians and the Prime Minister to re-engage in terms of our relationship with the United States. And I think because it's been successful in the past, I believe that that'll be a positive process because there are, there's a lot at stake in terms of the success of both economies and the partnership and the relationship. And uh, it's kind of like one of those things where we'll have the attention of Americans mm -hmm. and the administration, and I think Canadians will have to take advantage of that. So Harper has enjoyed a majority government in, in Canada, which means that he has had an absolute, his party has had an absolute majority of seats, which means that he has been a relatively efficient at moving policy along. Uh, it is possible to govern in Canada, I'm sorry, this is Civics 101, it's possible to govern in Canada uh, with a minority government, which means you have more seats than anyone else, but you don't have more than half of the seats, but you have to do that on a coalition basis. Some people are predicting that no matter who wins, it's going to be a minority government. They're not looking uh, at anyone coming out with a clear majority. So I'm going to ask my panelists, I hope Jonathan comes back, I think he just went to dissolve a trade agreement or to announce the end of the TPP. Uh, I'm going to ask my, my co-panelists to make a, make a little bit of a prediction, that, and it's, it's, listen carefully, it's a two or three parter. Hmm. Who's going to win? Is it going to be a minority or majority? And if it's a minority, is it going to hold? Can a coalition hold? How will they govern with a minority mm -hmm. government? I got to start with with my friend right. to the left. Um, I'll go with the numbers and the trends, and I, th I think it it will be a minority conservative. The the nuance and the importance would be how many seats. Um, it, the distinction that I would add to your comments: it is true you can govern if you don't have a majority. You don't need a coalition to govern. You only need to get past the, mid, the um, 50 percent plus one vote on matter of confidence that are mainly budget, okay. stuff like that. Money so it's bill, the only yeah. vote that matters. Mm -hmm. So for the rest of the time, you can you can be able to sway some votes. You still need a majority to get yeah, and things the first, done, yeah. right? But you're not defeated. Yeah. You, you would be defeated on a budget if mm -hmm. you lose it. And you, you do know. have to pass a budget to to govern. To govern, exactly. So my prediction, you'll get the conservative in power, and if it's a, if they are not, if it's a minority by a big chunk of seats, they will probably lose on that first budget, but we won't go back to an election. You will have the liberals having a shot at this with the other left-wing party in some sort of way. We, we've seen similar arrangement in, in the past 15 years of that, but so that would play out over maybe a year. Fun with Canadian government. There's so many mm. different permutations. Nick? I'd, I'd prefer to take things off the table because it's too early to do a firm prediction. So uh, the NDP will not win the election and the Conservatives will not form a majority. Beyond those two things, anything can realistically happen because of that. You know, I talked about the crossover between the Liberals and the New Democrats. If there's a mass movement at the, at the end, you know, we could be in a situation where even if the, liber the Liberals could have 33% and the Conservatives have 32% support, but the Conservatives win more seats because they're just more efficient at generating seats. In terms of a coalition, I think that a, a coalition could be viable in the short to intermediate term, but not in the long term. And uh, why I say that, it's kind of like any popular front. Whenever there's a popular front, everyone's kind of hugs and kisses when they want to get rid of the administration or regime of the day. And they usually they're pretty good at the beginning because the beginning of any kind of popular front type government is about, you know, s kind of r unwinding what's been done. And uh, I would imagine, and I have no inside information, but I would imagine at, if there was a popular front, so to speak, an informal popular front between the Liberals and the New Democrats, um, that there would probably be area, there would not necessarily be a formal arrangement or a formal parliamentary merger, but there would be an understanding that, you know, for the party that was not, for, for the, the second, the junior partner in the coalition, that there would just be issues that they would not support. So maybe it'll be a very short legislative agenda. My understanding, at least, is that one area of agreement could be democratic renewal. That if there was a coalition government, that that would be one thing that both the Liberals and the New Democrats want, 
that uh, perhaps as a coalition government, they could craft a package that both of that would be acceptable to both of those parties, including potentially things like proportional representation, mm. right? So, uh, and so, you know, my, uh, I would say that a coalition government um, between the uh, Liberals and the New Democrats could be viable in the short to intermediate term, but that it would probably have a limited number of things that it would focus on, things that they know that both parties would likely support, and they'd ignore the unpleasantries of things that they don't agree on. Now, if we want to get into bizarro fantasy politics, if the bloc, the separatist bloc Quebecois win seats, then the reality is for them, as a coalition partner, they just have a price. They don't really care who they're the partner with because their objective is just to get whatever they can get for Quebec. So, you know, picture a scenario. And, you know, the thing is, is that, you know, people say that the Conservatives have no coalition partners. Well, if the bloc wins seats, uh, the, conservatives could, the, it, the Conservatives would look at them not in terms of forming a formal coalition, but in terms of looking at a cluster of members that potentially could support specific legislation. And, you know, one thing that you should know is that the Conservatives have used omnibus legislation a lot in order to move forward a lot of their initiatives. And omnibus legislation is perfect for coalition governments because you can broker and horse deal on an omnibus bill and they could have, you know, have something on one issue and give something to a group of MPs that they know that they will count on for their votes. So I think in the short to intermediate term, there would be a, I think, could be a stable coalition government, but in, it would eventually unwind. Great. Okay, the question for you, Jonathan, is who's going to win, majority or minority? And if minority, then how will they govern? Yeah, okay. So uh, it says in my contract I don't have to make a prediction. Um, and oh, I well, wait, tell, tell you what, I'll read Ken's prediction first. Okay, good. <laughs> Two predictions. Blue Jays will win the World Series. <laughs> <laughs> they will win uh, within less than seven days. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, I'm gonna, I, I, I know the exact day I stopped making political predictions. It's when the Conservative Party formed, I guess it was, God, when did, remember they were there, the reforms? The, merger? the they, Canadian Alliance. And the, the Canadian the Alliance, and they had like eight different names. And, uh, and I remember I was talking about, uh, anyway, they formed, and I, was talk I wrote this column about this guy who would be, the, the, you know, he would be such a good leader for this party, and I was supporting him. And it came out in the newspaper the next day, and that day he um, crossed the aisle and became a liberal. Uh. Yeah, and I felt like such an idiot. And uh, people are like, hey, how'd your prediction go? Is it? So I, um, I now don't make any prediction. However, in this context, I am going to make a prediction, but it, it's not going to be the kind you're thinking of. So I predict that within 10 years, the NDP and the liberals will merge. And that all the strategic voting stuff, this three-party system, will go away and it'll be more like the United States. It'll be a two-party system because political scientists have studied this thing. I, there was a book, I think it was called The Dynamics of the Two-Party System. About, you know, the United States used to have all these other parties, right? It was like, you know, the Freemasons Party and the Whigs and stuff. And eventually it settled down and there were two parties. And this happens in a lot of Republican systems of government. It doesn't always happen in a parliamentary system where you can kind of get these blocks. And it also doesn't happen in countries where you have strong regionalist sentiment because then you could have a party like the Bloc Québécois, which, by the way, the Bloc Québécois was once the official opposition, uh, I guess, mm -hmm. 15 years ago or something like that. So, you know, and it's not impossible that you could get a Western regionalist party. However, what's, we've been sort of taking for granted that the people in the audience know the difference between the Liberals and the Conservatives and the NDP. If you go back 15 or 20 years, it's sort of made a difference because the NDP was kind of the militant, by Canadian standards, union-powered left-wing party. And in fact, I think to this day in the NDP party constitution, there is hardwired into that uh, a vote on party affairs for union membership. I mean, it's this really kind of like 1950s style British labor mentality. And the liberals were left of center, but it was kind of the Wall Street, or in our case, Bay Street friendly left of center. So you had union left, you had sort of white collar left, and then you had a conservative party. And that kind of made sense, except now it doesn't make any sense because the union movement has withered. A lot of the identity politics movements that powered the NDP, so there's a lot of student activisty types, that's gone. The Naomi Klein phenomenon is, is, is pretty much gone. Um, and so there really isn't any uh, reason for two left-wing parties to exist, especially now in this election, it's the most bizarre thing. You actually have the liberals running to the left of the NDP in certain cases. Mm. So we had this bizarre situation during the debate two weeks ago where you had 
uh, Justin Trudeau of the supposedly Bay Street friendly liberals saying, yeah, I'm going to raise taxes on, on, on the, the top 1% of Canadians. Uh, and then you had Mulcair of the NDP saying, no, I'm not going to do that. You know, that's, irre that's irresponsible. You know, that's, that's Marxist. Uh, and, and I mean, this is, this, is, this is crazy talk by Canadian standards. Um, but when you see stuff like that happen, to my mind, it's simple brand obstinacy that is, pre is preventing these two parties from merging. Um, and once you get, you know, if, if, if Harper wins, here's my prediction, if Harper wins majority and both the NDP and Liberals have to get new leaders, they will elect leaders that are sympathetic to the idea of merging because both of their bases will be so outraged at the fact you guys split the vote and you let Harper in for another term, you're an idiot, we're never letting this happen again. And that's where you're going to get a huge sea change in Canadian politics. But if we, I, th I would agree with you except on one item. So I think in the current structure, we'll see consolidation eventually. But if proportional representation is introduced, it basically allows the parties to maintain their brands. I would predict that the Conservative Party will split between the progressive Conservatives and the f old Canadian alliance. And then uh, when Americans are watching Canadian elections, it'll be like watching Italian elections, kind <laughs> of. Look at all those parties, holy, w <laughs> how can they make that work? Or Israeli elections. But so I think, I think the key decision point will be whether there's democratic renewal and proportional representation. If we're on the current path, which is first past the po post, then I would agree with you, Jonathan. I think there will be eventually a merger in a two-party kind of environment. If if the Liberals and New Democrats are part of a coalition and pass proportional representation, then each of those parties will continue because they can continue in that model. And then we'll see other parties kind of crowd into that space. And we'll see a balkanization where there'll be like multiple parties. You know, the, the problem with making predictions is that we are uh, on tape, so these predictions stay forever. And there is currently, I believe it's a liberal attack ad against Thomas Mulcair featuring this very same backdrop saying, I f I f I'm in favor of the Energy East pipeline. So be careful what you say, it will <laughs> haunt you forever. I didn't know we were being <laughs> <That's> <laughs> <laughs> It's entirely I off the record. I would like to recast some of my statements. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we have about five minutes left. Uh, I'd like to take some questions. We have Savannah. The, the amazing uh, uh, person, uh, uh, program assistant at the Canada Institute has got the microphone. And is your hand up or are you pointing to uh, Eric? Sir, there. Yes. Okay. One from this gentleman, one from that gentleman with the red tie, and one from the other red tie gentleman, starting with the gentleman at the back with the blue tie. Thank you for a great presentation. Question for Nick on trade. Yep. Um, it does appear that uh, the Prime Minister has decided to work toward getting the TPP deal. If the TPP deal is done in the next couple of days, is there going to be any outrage in the other two parties? From what I hear today, it sounds like no, despite um, the sectoral impacts in dairy and manufacturing, and um, despite the pressure, particularly in manufacturing in Ontario, mm -hmm. long term, the decline of manufacturing, the decline of auto manufacturing. Are these just two small segments to matter, or do you anticipate any sort of a further reaction? It's kind of interesting to us in the U.S. There doesn't seem to be, you know, the, the, the Democrats would see, uh, or, or the opposition would see this as a great opportunity to stick it to the other side. That hasn't happened from the other two candidates yet, as far as I can tell, and as far as you guys are saying. Yeah, Does I that change if there's a deal is finalized? So I, I would say that if a, a deal is finalized, uh, the New Democrats, because of their connections to the unions, would probably make hay of it. And you know, the thing is, is that the deal could be good, but people are afraid of change, right? Even when they're told. So, uh, you know, to your point, um, I would say the, the dairy industry, the dairy provisions are probably not a significant political risk because those people, the, the, those farmers can be, uh, their, qu their quotas, the value of their quotas, which protect them, can be bought out. So they can be kind of fairly managed. They're not highly concentrated, except in the province of Quebec, and they don't have a lot of numbers. And for average Canadians, they'll probably be thinking, hey, we'll have some, we might have some American cheese and American milk for less, so bring it on. Um, I think the automotive could be a little more problematic. It's a bit of a dog whistle for a lot of uh, Canadians because we've always prided ourselves on our automotive industry. 
that if there's something that is perceived as being uh, putting the automotive uh, industry at risk, uh, that that could uh, that could inflame opinion. Specifically, you know, the interesting thing is a lot of these ridings that uh, have automotive plants also coincidentally, with the exception of the Windsors, um, <laughs> coincidentally the Conservatives do well in like St. Catharines, uh, you know, Oakville has the Ford plant, Durham Region and Oshawa, which has the GM plant. There are other plants. Magna International has plants in kind of uh, <coughs> kind of that belt in the middle of Ontario. Um, and I think that could, uh, I don't think the leaders would make hay of it, but I think it's the fear and, and of, of the unknown in terms of what it would mean for the Canadian automotive industry that could be a risk. And uh, that's why if, the, if there is an announcement, and the announcement that we expect, the Conservatives are going to have to be very well organized in order to kind of explain, this is what's been agreed, this is what it means to Canada, and, and from a Conservative perspective to say, this is the best path forward. Yeah, I'm going to jump in on that. I would be very, very surprised if the Conservatives would make a deal that was unfriendly to the auto sector, which would be where the NDP would weigh in and say yep. this is a bad deal. So they are, are so close together on that, and it would be so surprising that the Conservatives would give up those auto sector interests in order to get a deal, even to get it by October 19th, that I, mm. I don't anticipate it. Well, I agree. And, and the way they could play it is, oh, it was much worse. Right, right. Uh, yeah, and by right. the way, you, you <laughs> see a, par a parallel with, the, uh, with this in the United States with Hillary Clinton, where because the whole thing is done in secret, you know, she can play a million different shades, and depending on the polling numbers on any given day, she can say, well, you know, what I'd like to see in the deal is this. Well, I, what I'd like to see in the deal, and because it's all secret, she doesn't have ownership of it. Um, you can play politics with it, with, with it all you want, right? It's, um, and by the way, in foreign policy, the same was true of the Iran nukes deal. Like the Republicans say, well, if I had been president, I'd have gotten this, 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 and this. Um, but it's kind of a fantasy diplomacy thing you're going because you're not the person who actually has to do the trade-offs against the partner. Let's get this question from the red tie there and that red tie there, and uh, those will be our two wrap-up questions, and then we'll deal with them um, as a group. Uh, so in the Globe earlier this week, there was a survey quoted that said uh, trade was the number one foreign policy issue uh, among Canadians. Um, That's the Globe and Mail, right? The Globe and Mail. Not yes. the Boston Globe. Yeah, not the Boston Globe, yeah, yeah, yeah. sorry. Yes. <laughs> Should there qualify. Canadian, yeah. Yeah. That's, yeah, I am, yeah. <laughs> um, uh, so I think that all parties are pretty uh, you know, in agreement on, on trade being important. But I'm less interested in, in, in trade and what's actually going to be done with it. So my question is, Will we see a walking back of the, quote, economic diplomacy that the Harper government uh, has rolled out with the uh, uh, global commerce strategy of 07 and then a further re-upping uh, with the uh, global markets uh, action plan in 2013, especially with the CEDA uh, and foreign affairs merger? That's a great question. Can I ask you where you come from? Uh, I'm from, uh, I, I'm working with the, uh, UN Economic Commission to Latin America and ah, the Caribbean. Very excellent question. Thank, Thank you for that. Uh, another red tie. Uh, two very quick questions. One, um, just to confirm, when you were mentioning about a coalition government, you're not meaning a UK-style conservative. It, it, Correct. It's just a position where you'll get some votes, but only one party would have ministers, and, and they are the official government. Yeah, it would be kind of uh, an understanding an okay. informal understanding, yes. And the second question, uh, just any sense that there could be an Alberta-style surprise in the outcome of the election? I know that there were polls prior to the Alberta. So is, there, I is that a possibility? Is there some sense that that could happen? Well, maybe I'll start and then mm -hmm. pass it off to you guys. Uh, in terms of uh, an Alberta-style, um, for the NDP, no, uh, as an answer. Um, you know, the Alberta numbers moved because the, uh, the Prentice campaign, and he was the premier, the progressive conservative premier of Alberta, um, actually had a bad campaign and uh, had a number, made a number of mistakes. Actually, there was one kind of infamous day where his tour bus hit a car. Uh, he, he attacked the opposition party. Uh, on the platform and found out that the same person that uh, that had done the New Democrat platform had actually done the numbers for the conservative platform, had his finance minister contradict him on a tax uh, issue on the same day, and all these things happened in one day, and it kind of derailed the campaign very quickly. Um, for there to be an uh, Alberta-type phenomenon, it will take more than one mistake 
of Stephen Harper. I think he can probably, and in my experience, believe it or not, it's three. You know, uh, a camp, uh, a politician doesn't usually get punished. So it's kind of like a politician or a campaign makes a mistake, and people take note. Oh, look, there's a mistake. And then there's a second problem, and then they're wondering, I wonder if there's a problem. And then after the third problem, it is, there is a problem. So for us to have, uh, I would say, a dramatic change, where maybe a dramatic change would be in the category of a majority government, conservative or liberal, uh, there one of the parties would have to have a catastrophic event, a number of catastrophic events, in order to kind of really shake the numbers. That being said, those numbers between the Liberals and the New Democrats are the ones to watch because those can move on a dime. And, you know, politics is a lot like shopping. They're last-minute shoppers. People will wait until the last weekend. And you know what? We pull through the election. The numbers on the last weekend are always the most fascinating to watch because that's when the numbers really move and people firm up their opinions. I'm going to do, take the wonky question very quickly, and I'm just going to uh, say that the, the, the global commerce strategy and the global markets action plan aren't that different. They're fundamentally the same strategy. They're just interrupted by the, global, by the financial crisis and the change of government. Um, but they basically say Canada, sh what they've come down to now is Canada should continue to trade with its strongest trading partner with the United States, but should also diversify. And I can't see any of the parties departing from that, even the New Democratic Party has said, we are embracing trade, we just don't really like any of the trade agreements we previously had, but they're, they're com coming around to liberalized and, and external trade. There is a great chapter written by the director of the Canada Institute coming out in a book uh, published by IRPP on trade, the, the Harper years. Uh, look for it in a bookstore near you, you in about six months. Look, the, on the economy, the three biggest factors uh, that will affect the Canadian economy are all out of the government's control. International price of oil, uh, Canadian interest rates, which, I mean, there's it's very little they can do when interest rates around the world are, 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 are so small. Uh, and uh, <laughs> I knew there was a third. <laughs> but, uh, oh, and, 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 uh, and, and housing, the housing bubble, because governments can usually do very, very little to prevent a housing bubble uh, from, from popping, as the United States learned in 2008. Uh, right now, interest rates are, are, are super low in, in, in ca uh, Canada. I was uh, door knocking with a candidate, and an old person came to the door and said, look, this is ridiculous. Interest rates are next to nothing. You're running a policy of um, making things great for spenders, but you're, you're screwing savers, and I'm a senior, and you're screwing me, and you better do something about that. As if the government can just magically raise interest rates 10%, which they can't do. They can't magically raise the oil price to, to $150, $150 a barrel. Uh, they can't magically make real estate uh, prices stay up. And by the way, I mean, Toronto, Vancouver, we have huge bubbles. If you look at the ratio of home prices to median income, you're getting to a very similar level to what you had in the United States in the, the mid to late 2000s. It's a big issue. Um, in terms of whether there's going to be a big surprise, I think there might be. When I go door knocking with these, these folks, a lot of the people say, I want to beat Harper. <coughs> Tell me who to vote for, liberal, NDP, and if they get the sense that 51% of their neighbors are going to go liberal or 51% of their neighbors are going to go NDP, you could get what in mathematical terms is an unstable dynamical equilibrium where you get sort of nonlinear feedback effects because all your friends are voting the same way and it becomes like a, a landslide. Uh, you saw that in Quebec. You saw that with the election of the NDP, remember? I mean, completely unstable dynamical effects, uh, which is feedback effects from your neighbors, and that's something... No post, even the best pollster in the world can't predict uh, for the same reason that, that no unstable dynamical equilibrium can be predicted by, by any analytical model. And I think that could happen. But first, neighbors have to decide who each other is voting for, and then you, you could see, theoretically, a big win for either the Liberals or the NDP. Any wrap-up? I would agree with that. I would just add one thing about Cuba, and I, I, I would be curious to know what are the links now that American businesses are doing calling their Canadian colleagues because Canada has more experience doing commerce and business with Cuba. So it, that's just a thought there. That mm -hmm. I, I think that's an excellent thought for future programming for the Canada Institute. I mean, my, my opinion on that is that Canadian business has been there, but it's been a difficult neighborhood, and having the U.S. there is going to make it easier for Canadians to do business. But that is something... I think we have to do that event in Cuba, though. 
Absolutely. Yeah. All right. <laughs> now, now that everybody in this room can go there and Walmart could set up in Cuba, why not, right? Absolutely, absolutely. Okay, I'm going to move to the podium for the final address. Thank you all for coming. Thank you for your participation. Thanks to those of you who are watching us by webinar and uh, also uh, checking your Blackberries and uh, sit sitting in your pajamas. Um, we've had a great event. I've learned a lot. Uh, this has been terrific. I would like to thank my, my panelists and guests. I would like to thank our co-sponsors for this program, the Council of the Americas. It's actually the Americas Society in Council of the Americas, isn't it, Kezia? Okay, Council of the Americas here in Washington, and Kezia McTagg, who's been a great, uh, who's been our, our uh, head and shoulders and everything else on putting this program together. Thank you very much. Uh, the Canadian Council for the Americas, which is, uh, has left, but are great partners with us. Uh, all my, my colleagues at the, uh, at the Canada Institute, Andrew, Andrew Finn and Savannah Boylan, thank you so much. Thank you to all of us, if, if, all of you. And if we get it wrong, don't call us and, and uh, complain on the 19th. We, we did our best. So thank you. Thank you. That was fun. Thanks, Nick. Thanks. Thanks. That was terrific. That was fun. I, I gotta that was fun. You got to start.